my grandma was like a Comic Con goer. Um, but they were like Star Trek conventions, and she would go and she would bring stuff back. So it was really cool. I'm so excited to introduce our guest tonight. I have been a crazy stan of his since I first laid eyes on his Instagram page, which is saturated with beautiful mock-ups of the X-Men in the MCU. He is a toy photographer, and each photo he takes is bursting with so much vibrancy and skill. He is also a big old friend stan, scream stan, basically anything with Courtney Cox. I look forward to his Toy Hall Tuesdays because they are literally the highlight of my day. He is an artist, activist, and advocate, and he has had one incredible journey that landed him at NECA. And today we're going to chat all about action figures as well as astonishing X-Men. Please welcome with great pleasure, Blainer Things. Ah. <laughs> I love how you did the double hand wave. I mean, that's a Blainer thing. Hi, how are you? I'm doing well. I'm excited. I'm like super excited. I don't know. I'm trying to remember if I've ever done like a video podcast before. Have you not? I don't. I don't know. I was on a YouTube live one time. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm excited, and I get to talk <laughs> about like my favorite X Men stuff. So you love astonishing X Men. I do. I do. And we're going to find out why. Today. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's so funny because we were talking months ago and I was like, oh, you have to come on the show. What do you want to talk about? And the first thing you said was astonishing X-Men. Yeah. And I was like, yes. Although because of everything with Whedon, I was like, I, you know, it's something I don't want to touch, but I have since really changed my mind because so many people have told me like, it's so much goes into creating a comic book than just one person. It's an artist, it's an editorial team, it's a production people, it's the people at the factory who print the pages, it's a colorist, it's a letterist. So I am just so happy to talk about Astonishing because I think it's such a great series for a lot of reasons. But before we get into it, I want to get to know you a little better. I mean, I know you because we've been talking on DMs for a while, but you know one thing I was thinking about after I had written your intro? And I wanted to ask you, and we've never talked about, were you a fan of Dirt and Cougar Town? Mm, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, tried, I tried Cougar Town. And no. No, but I'm a fan of Ace Ventura and Masters of the Universe. Oh my God. So I think I... they're greatly, highly more regarded than... Cougar Town. <laughs> I liked Cougar Town because it took place in Florida, if I remember correctly. How was that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like 38 seconds in, Blaine made it before offending tons no. of No, don't worry about it. I'm a Florida boy. I get it. I I I was just in it um the last few months in, in Florida, and someone turned to me and they were like, it's so lawless down here. <laughs> And it is. it is, it is, but all right. So let's dive into like your history with collecting. When did you first get into collecting? Um, I know this is, it sounds like such a cop out answer, but literally my whole life, my, uh, my parents were both collectors. My mom more like tchotchkes, things like that, but she was like a completist. So she, you know, started to collect something. She had to finish it. And uh, my dad was a huge nerd, uh, Atari that into Nintendo, um, Dungeons and Dragons, Star Trek. My grandma was a huge Trekkie, uh, and she had bought toys for my dad, who then kind of outgrew them, or maybe didn't outgrow them, and I just weaseled my way into owning them. Uh, but I inherited toys from literal birth, and it's funny, like looking at baby tapes and baby pictures, being like. Two, literally two years old and having like collections lined up along the along my bed. I love that. I've never met someone who's told me their grandmother was a big old nerd. Like, what was it having an abuela or a grandmother, excuse me, who was a Trekkie? Uh, amazing. Like, literally one of the best things that I had ever gotten from her 
was uh, an original 1975 Spock action figure. It was like that Mego style. Shut up. She had found it in her in the back of her closet. She had intended to give it to my father one year as a Christmas present and forgot about it back there. And decades had passed um, and she had given it to me one year and it was like my prized possession. So it was really cool to have a grandmom. Every year she got me something. Uh, she would go to Las Vegas. And <laughs> I don't know if it's there anymore, but at the time there was like an entire Star Trek thing like the bridge of the enterprise d was there and everything and they had these sort of like comic cons my grandma was like a comic con goer um but they were like star trek conventions and she would go and she would bring stuff back so it was really cool so is collecting for you more of a byproduct of familial history like a legacy you inherited from your dad and your grandmother uh, and your mom, yeah. and your mom as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think there's like kind of two sides to that coin. I think it's kind of was passed down to me on one hand, and then on the other hand, um, through we're getting so personal through rough periods of my life, mm-hmm. I used uh, figures and drawing as an escape from the real world. So I also kind of have that um, emotional connection to collecting and having it be the thing that doesn't let me down or the thing that's around this. I know that sounds so pathetic. It does not at all. Everybody's got a blankie, right? (laughs) (laughs) No, I I've said this multiple times. The X-Men saved my life growing up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would go to school. I would be bullied relentlessly. I mean, people were savage to me. But I could always come home and I can pick up an issue of X-Men or watch the animated series. And there was Xavier's school where there were a bunch of weirdos and outcasts who were just waiting for me to join the party. And that idea of, of that school provided not only escapism for me, but it also gave me the tools to understand what it meant to be marginalized, what it meant to be the other. And my brain started cooking from there. So by the time I got to college and I would study, let's say like feminist theory, I had a really good baseline because of comic books. And it doesn't just end with the X-Men, just like other stuff in general. And even like high concepts about fantasy. Like I could digest alternate timelines and time travel better than some of my other contemporaries at the time, of course, because I had that baseline in comics. It's true. It, it definitely, it's that whole art imitates life. Uh, and I think X-Men particularly, especially for any marginalized persons, uh, kind of really was that highlight where it was the first comic to really address people who were different. Yeah. You know, every other comic was kind of that stereotypical hero. This was the first time, you know, Fantastic Four, they were praised for um, who they were. They were made famous. Everybody loved them. Uh, They were Marvel's first family. And then you had the X-Men who were Marvel's cousins that they said were on vacation when they were in the mental institute. So (laughs) I love that. Yeah, I... I I don't remember the analogy specifically, but I remember picking up an issue of Wizard Magazine and they said something to the effect of like, you know the X-Men because the X-Men are you. The Fantastic Four are like that perfect family. The Avengers are like the football players, but the X-Men are people. And yeah, it just resonates with so with so many of us. So let wait, wait, wait. Let, let me let me dial back a little bit. So you're, 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 you inherited collecting. You had that natural curiosity for it from your family. When did you start branching out into what you liked yourself? Like, when did you first start chasing after figures or comics that were just a hundred percent you? Uh, like coincidentally enough and not to blow smoke up the podcast fast, but uh, I think it was X-Men because I remember being very young and, uh, like the first movie I saw in movie theaters was 1989 Batman with Michael Keaton. Oh my God. Yes. You know, my, my parents were big DC people. We watched Batman 66 and 
we watched uh, The Flash from the 90s and Linda Carter Wonder Woman. Uh, and I used to watch Super Friends, you know, the Hanna-Barbera Hour, and uh, they would play Super Friends. So I kind of was thrown into DC Comics. So mm-hmm. X-Men, I think, really was the first one that I kind of ventured off onto my own. It wasn't even comics, oddly enough. Uh, we had a trading card store in my town. Yes. And there were no comics. I don't know if this was normal in the 80s and 90s, um, but there were no comics. It was the, an entire store just trading cards. Um, and that was like before Pokemon and stuff. It's so weird. <laughs> No, no, I know exactly what you're talking about. I had line drive beeper and comics, and there were very little comics in it. Yeah. A lot of beepers, and then all trading cards. And my <laughs> gateway drug to the X Men were the trading cards. Yep. Was the '94 Fleer Ultras? Yeah, I, I probably was before that. I don't want to age myself, um, but yeah, they were they were my introduction into X Men. I I drew and knew in detail what many characters look like without ever knowing who they were or what they were from until I got a little bit older and could buy my own comics. I was talking about this with Zeb Wells a couple of months ago, where when you grew up in the eighties and nineties, you went to a comic book store and you prayed that they had the issues you <laughs> wanted. And maybe you found an issue that was halfway through the story with characters. You had no fucking clue who they so were. And all you knew was this one little panel of them, or in our case, the trading cards. And you were obsessed with them for years Mm -hmm. until you were actually able to go out and start buying them on your own. And it turned us all into like little archaeologists where you could like, like mine this story or this data from another source. And it made it so precious because today it is so easy just to go on Wikipedia and be like, who is Doug Ramsey? Who is Monet? You know what I mean? And like, Back then, I didn't know who Doug Ramsey was. I'm obsessed with Doug Ramsey now. But I probably had only one issue of him until I was like 25. You know? Because I'm that old too. Because Wikipedia really wasn't a thing until my 20s. Yeah. Yeah. I had uncannyxmen.net. So weird that people... We didn't even have the internet when I liked X-Men. Yeah, no. you. And if you did have the internet, it was AOL and it was (laughs) dial-up. And you had to wait for you got mail. Yep, I can hear it in my head the whole <laughs> whole thing. But it's it's so true. The first X Men comic that I purchased with my own money was down the shore, and it was this comic store that had uh, all the characters and oddly enough Bart Simpson inside <laughs> of the building. And it, I found it in one of those kind of spinny racks. Oh yeah. So it was like just whatever was in there, and it was probably you know whatever the cheap <laughs> half all, but it was um, professor X storm and Cyclops. And they, they were in the blackbird and it had crashed in this snowy region. And they spent the entire issue kind of just in the snow. Like there was no like really big action storyline. And I just remember this, this is the X-Men comics <laughs> <laughs> the cartoons so much better. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I mean, the cartoon was pretty iconic. I mean, there's no disagreement on that. Yeah, the spinny racks. I remember being on vacation one summer and going, I was in Sanibel Island and I, there was a spinny rack in the grocery store on the island. And that's where I first discovered Age of Apocalypse. But it was like the fourth issue of Astonishing X Men, the one before, the one we're going to talk about today. And it was just rogue. And it was the last part of that story where she says, tonight, the age of apocalypse is over. And I was like, I didn't even know it begun. You know what I mean? I didn't even know age of apocalypse was a thing because you didn't get the information the way you get it now. It's like now Marvel tweets something and it's like blasted everywhere. But before you were just at the mercy of your local comic book store. And much like you, like, look, I grew up in Miami during the 80s and the 90s during the cocaine war. Like, we did not have a comic book store on Calle Ocho. Line Drive, Beeper, and Comics was at the end of 8th Street, right before you got into the Everglades. So, by luck, my primo was into X-Men. And by luck, my abuela was just too tired to take us. So, we just went on our bikes. <laughs> and, like, literally had chancletas and everything when I walked in there. And my cousin just got the double Rogue card. Rogue was my gateway. And he was here like... I don't want this. You take it. And I was like, 
who is this woman who can absorb memories, <laughs> you know? And why is her name unrevealed? Again, I was like nine or 10, whatever. And I could not understand how no one knew who her name was. I was right. fascinated by that. Why didn't anyone just ask her? Yeah, like, wait, like no one was like, hey, really, what is your name? <laughs> like, okay. And she would have been like, my name is Anna. You're like, great, we'll call you Rogue, but I just need to know what your <laughs> real name is. We got you, we'll call you. Um. But the figures were obviously really big in those in those years. Do you did you collect those figures? Did you collect the toy biz figures? Oh yes. Yeah. Tell oh, me about it. Tell me about that journey. Same thing as the uh, trading cards. I would have figures that I had absolutely no idea who they were, but it was the golden age uh, of action figures. It was, you know, what I believe the reason we have the action figures we have today is because we are now in positions of power to create these. And we grew up fascinated. It was a toy revolution. So I was so hungry to just get these amazing looking action figures that I was scooping them up. I didn't care what character it was. If I saved five bucks, you know, I, I finagled that tax. <laughs> X-Men toys were four ninety nine for all of you young people watching. Um, X-Men toys were four ninety nine. dollars 99 99 yeah kb and true <laughs> toys r us i i still and play world i had a play world i don't know if you yeah, had that city. you had what it was called kitty city oh the my god were like the, the mascot for all you northeast people 499 mm -hmm. so legends like five bucks in allowance and like swindled my mom for the extra cents and you got like storm with her light up chest mm -hmm. you got colossus with his like barbell and everything yep. it was my god when professor x came out in the chair it, which was much later and it was so much bigger that the um like not the clamshell the blister packaging was mm. extended so much and it was the same price and it was like weighted and heavy like my little brain I was like, oh, it's only four ninety nine for his whole chair. <laughs> well, I, I agree. I, I I remember when the hover chair came out. I remember when they redid Storm in her silver costume with like the cape. I mean, it was a cape. Like I call them the Coke bottle. The cans, yeah, the cans, was... whatever they are, and they were still the same price. And I remember my mom would be like, "I'm so happy you play with these toys because they're so cheap." I mean, she said in her, you know, her thick Guamanasa accent, I'm just trying to be facetious as I'm doing her voice. But um, X-Men, though, well, actually, no, I was about to say that's when I started, like, really hunting figures. I started hunting figures with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And I remember I wanted Leonardo and I wanted April O'Neil, who was, I think, one of the first chases. And I'm curious. What did you say? Oh, yeah, right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm, so I'm curious with you, when did you start hunting figures? I would say hunting. I can't really consider, because I've always kind of gone and, and wanted to go to one of the toy stores and find something. Um, but in terms of like superpowers and X-Men, they were relatively plentiful. Mm -hmm. uh, don't really remember ever having trouble finding the toys that I wanted until I was super big into Star Trek. Thank you to my grandma. Um, and when Star Trek Voyager came out, that was the first time that only certain stores had them. And they were mixed in with the other Star Trek Deep Space Nine and Next Generation figures. Um, so they were like difficult to locate. And I remember reading somewhere, it was probably Toy Fair or Wizard Magazine or something, that uh, certain characters weren't being made they, they weren't producing as many of so that was kind of my first introduction into like what a chase figure would be uh and i remember it was tom paris and then later seven of nine they were like impossible to find so i remember like asking my mom you know what do you, what do you want to do today and i would say can we please go to just two stores and see if they have them uh so that was probably my first take I, I feel like in today's world, it's the secondary market and the pricing that makes it impossible for collectors. But back in the day when there was no eBay, it was the 
going to every store in your area and just being limited by your geography yeah. because I, I could never find April. The other one I, I tried to chase was Catwoman from Batman Returns. Do you have her? Do you have her? Well, I'm going to show you. I'm going to run it. I have to. Let me see. Oh, my God. There she is. With the whipping action. The whipping action. And she comes with, like, the... I mean, the like her, uh, <sighs> this scale we ever got. Of course. I mean, like, I'm sorry, you're a gay boy in the 80s, 90s. You love Michelle Pfeiffer as Catwoman. Um, I eventually did find her. The one I did not find was Poison Ivy from the animated series. Oh, I thought you were going to whip her out. (laughs) I have have the DC Collectibles version now. Oh, I gotcha. You know what? I'm really disappointed that we didn't get the Selena Kyle um, one that they were supposed to release. I had her on pre-order. Oh. And I don't like the Mondo one. No shade to Mondo because I love. I have a lot of Mondo stuff, but I didn't like it. I just don't like the scale. I can't yeah. do too large of the scale. Um, but yeah, I have so the neck one, the quarter scale Neko one, because obviously, but yes, obviously. Oh, we're gonna get to how you land on Neko as well. Um, but yeah, so like collecting back in the day is just so much different now because I don't feel availability is a, an issue for me at least. It's more the prices on a secondary market if you miss like a pre-order, especially like when you start collecting internationally. Like I love the Ray Earth robots that they're doing, but there's only so many pre-orders in the US. And so I had to get it on the secondary market and it was like $400 just to get it. I'm like, ah, motherfucker. We still do it. But we still do it because we're crazy. Is there is there a holy grail for your collection that you've always wanted but have never gotten? I get asked this a lot. And I never have a good answer or like, I, I feel like there's got to be a better answer. And I usually get a different answer for every, t- every <laughs> t- um, off the top of my head. I found out much later after collecting Kenner aliens, I had never seen it. And if you didn't see it at that time, you didn't know it existed because there was no Instagram. Uh, there was no toy community. But Kenner Aliens had released a Queen Hive playset. It was a large movie accurate queen because the queen that we got in Kenner style did not look anything like she was in the movie. Uh, and it came with a whole hive with like eggs and um, it's, it's beautiful. Even to this day, it's beautiful. And I still have never gotten it. Hang on, I'm looking that up because I can't picture it in my head. I, I wasn't a big Kenner uh, fan. I... Did they do a Street Fighter line back in the day? Kenner is my life. Uh, no. Who did Street Fighter? Do you know what I'm talking about? Like the Street Fighters that were kind of like really like small. Yeah. They look like G.I. Joes. Yeah. They were. I think it was probably a G.I. Joe. Yes. Oh, she looks beautiful. I'm seeing her now. Mm. <laughs> mm. Mm. I get it. I get it. So what, which is the best line out there right now that you think? is is worth collecting and that you like really get a bang for your buck. And I know that's like a really complicated question. That's like someone asking me like, which is the best X book? And it's like, well, <laughs> it sort of just depends. I mean, we assume they're all good, but which like personally do you think like you get all the bells and whistles? Oh my goodness. I mean, I sound a little biased if I say NECA. <laughs> you can say NECA. But I mean, really, they are, they're pieces of art. Yeah. They're not, they're not really action figures. They mm-hmm. are articulated pieces of art. And I'm in awe by the sculpt and paint and just overall look, the, the realism of it. I'm not huge on stylized. So the realism uh, really draws me in. Um, but in terms of expansiveness and something for everyone, I would mm-hmm. have to say, Marvel Legends. I mean, they are so deep into the line now, and they're really hitting every sort of... Because like you just said, it's like asking what your favorite X book is. There are so many different universes and versions of these characters and stories um, for vastly different X-Men fans. Uh, and Marvel Legends really does do a great job in creating an entire umbrella universe, not just sticking with one. 
Titan. I Marvel Legends, I have been collecting them since Wave 1 when we had that Toad figure that was supposed to originally be part of the movie line all the way through today. And I remember back in like the mid 2000s when the license had shifted over to Hasbro and then we got a couple waves and then they kind of stopped for a couple of years. And then we had the return of Marvel Legends with mm-hmm. like Hope and Thor. And from that point on, it has been insane. The line has only gotten better and better. And like their live streams, the way they interact with the stands. We had Ryan Ting on the podcast a couple of months ago. All right. Blaine, we literally spoke with him for like three hours. This guy took the time to answer every single question thoughtfully. Mm -hmm. He was engaged and he knew what he was talking about. It's just such a great vibe they have going on right now. There are um, very special people that work in the industry who just have it all, right? Mm -hmm. They've got business side of it and they know how to do their, uh, their job wonderfully. And then on top of that, they are such hardcore fans and know not just what they want as a fan, but what like the majority wants. And Ryan is definitely one of them. I'm very, very fortunate to know people in various companies who are like that. Uh, and I can, I can kind of spot it from a mile away. And he is, he's very good people. And I am so happy that he's on the Marvel Legends team and his shows in the work and with Dwight and Dan. Uh, Tony's no longer with Marvel, but having these people on the team that are genuine fans of the product they're developing uh, really, really shows. And you can tell probably around that return (laughs) is when you know certain people hopped on the team. (laughs) The work shows. The love shows. You did a digital mock of Ryan for his birthday. I did. I did. Oh, this is video. I guess I could show it. Yeah. And we can flash on screen. I have basic video editing skills. Oh, well, then I'm <laughs> showing it now. <laughs> <laughs> now, right there. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's absolutely stunning. <laughs> I'm pretending that I'm looking at it, even though when people like see this, they'll see it there. But uh, if you're listening to the podcast on audio, Blaine did a wonderful mock of Ryan in a Marvel Legends packaging and go check it out at Blainer Things. So how do you think collecting has evolved over the years? And, and, and being that kid who was jumping from store to store to who you are today with the own community you've created and working at NECA, how do you think spanning all those years, things have changed? Um, that's my Oprah question. I, yeah, <laughs> it's a deep one, and I'm going to give a deep answer. I mentioned earlier how it was the golden age of action figures when my your generation, I'm assuming your generation, I think you're around the same age. Um, when our generation were when we were kids and we wanted that imagination, we strived for that imagination. Um, it was action figures. Um, and now that we are adults and in positions of power, we are wanting to recreate what we loved as children and, or we want to create what we always wanted and never got. Um, so we are in this kind of new era, new golden age of action figures because the collectors are now the creators. Um, and I think seeing that evolution, not only are, are the collectors now creators, but you look at Comic-Con and you look at the action figure photography community, you look at toy communities, collectors helping collectors, all these different forums and pages and conventions it's because when we were growing up, we didn't have that connection. We didn't know that there were more than those three friends you knew. Uh, we didn't know that there were more of us out in the world. And this kind of new era, I work best in analogies and not to get too ex sappy, but uh, you know, this kind of new era is the era of Cerebro. We were able to pop that helmet on and suddenly the globe opened and we could see 
there were so many mutants in the world. So I was literally just thinking that when you were saying it with (laughs) with professor and then Logan next to me, you're like, see Logan, we're not as alone as you think we are. It's so beautiful the way you said that. I'm sorry. (laughs) Like I'm just internalizing that. (laughs) I have nothing else to say. We're done. Thank you. (laughs) That was really beautiful. I agree with you. And part of the reason, you know, I think we are all bonding right now is that we have just discovered ourselves with social media, Mm -hmm. especially during the pandemic. A lot of us leaned into these hobbies, these passions in a very strong and real way. And every time I feel like I, I speak with someone new or, or you when we first met. It's like, holy shit, you did these mocks of what the X-Men are going to look like in the MCU. That's so fucking cool. Or someone who's never heard of the X-Men before, but bought one of the issues of Hickman and they have so many questions and you just want to share it. It's just such a beautiful thing right now, which I think for a couple of years though, up until, I, I mean, I used to go on the CBR message boards until like 2014, 2015 it could be very toxic and it could be very vitriolic. And I feel now it's just a community and you can go and, and you can be a geek and you can be from any walk of life as a geek. And you can still enjoy these stories, these action figures, these movies, these comics. Yeah. And, you know, I think like you said, over quarantine, it became much more um, not necessarily relevant, but, via social media, uh, I know not to sound like I'm, I'm like plugging on my IGTV over quarantine. I had done Blainer Things, the series in which I interviewed on Instagram live industry professionals. And it was because we didn't have conventions and I didn't realize I became very, uh, spoiled to conventions and being able to talk to these industry professionals and find out the behind the scenes and how the sausage is made and how much, uh, you know, they're also fans of, of comics and and nerd pop in general and not having that comic con for like one year. It's like, Oh my God, like there are people who have never been to comic con and know nothing about these amazing people. So I started interviewing them for that reason, just to show, uh, how connected we could be and how, just like you said, there are so many different walks of life. Uh, loving the exact same things. Can I ask a, a question? Have your parents and grandmother seen the community you've built on Instagram and YouTube and Twitter? I certainly don't think I built any community. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, like I've been the, around a while, but <laughs> <laughs> but you know, like you you do toy hall Tuesdays. You were doing those Insta live interviews. Yeah. I, I'm curious, like they pass that passion on to you and you've, you've turned it into something and you've also gone on to work at NECA. Like, are they, they must be like, Holy shit. (laughs) Yeah. uh, Sadly, my grandmother is no longer with us. uh, What was her name? Marie. Oh, thank you, Marie. I was going to, I was going to show my Star Trek tattoo with her name. Oh, let's see it. I got to get up and take the fine. I don't want That'll be on the OnlyFans version. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you, Marie, for putting that passion in you. For 100%, 100%. And honestly, it sounds weird, but probably like her death had a lot to do with like me wanting to um, not wait around and not uh, sit on things and and really push for what I want. Um, But yeah, my mom had gone from I was a hairdresser for 20 years and she had gone from go to beauty school first. (laughs) She had worked at a salon. My aunt owned a salon, family full of hairdressers. And she saw that it was lucrative. She saw it was quick money. Uh, She saw that I had a natural talent for it. And she didn't really, you know, she's a small town girl. Uh, She's been on an airplane twice in her life. Um, uh, She didn't really see that there were any art jobs around here. So she didn't think there were art jobs, period. And she encouraged me to go to beauty school first so that I could be the licensed professional and have something to fall back on should I choose to go to art school because I wanted to go to conceptual design and I wanted to design toys and costumes for movies and uh, comic books, things like that. 
Uh, so she, that is really great to see. Sorry, it's a long answer for a short question. That's really great to see because she went from not knowing that you could do anything lucrative with this nerd hobby uh, to like telling her she is a director at a, a retirement community to like telling her residents how proud she is of her son for working at a toy company. You know, I love uh, that. Yeah. So it's really, it's really great to see that once she saw uh, that there was more to it, it, it was all, all proud. Well, I mean, that's incredible. And uh, sidebar, I love your style. So the fact that you were styling hair for 20 years is very evident because you got swag, man. Like literally your swag is next level. Every, it's funny. Everyone says uh, when they find out what I do, they're like, oh, no wonder your hair's so great. I'm like I don't do anything to my hair. <laughs> I, can't, I can't take credit for that. That's just really good genes. Well, A, you do have naturally great prodigious hair, but also <laughs> when I bleached my hair, you were the first to be like, hey, wait, you need a deep <laughs> conditioner. <laughs> and I did, and it made all the difference in the world, but you fucking like eyeballed it. You're just so, I think the world of you, as you know. <laughs> I just have an attention to detail, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so before we get into Astonishing X-Men, I just want to get your feels on the X-Men in today's world. How do you feel about the Hickman relaunch? So um, I'm very open to it. I have not read anything uh, past House of X, Powers of X. I came late um, before that started. I was like, oh God, they're rebooting again. Like they had just rebooted and I didn't like the last reboot at all. Um, so I was very turned off to X-Men. I am very, like, I still call Kate Kitty. Smack, but call her Kate. I'm very, like, X-Men is what X-Men did for me as a child, and I don't want to let go of that, right? Yeah. Marvel Legends are the more classic books. Um, so I, I hold on to X-Men very, very tightly and there are many 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 iterations that would probably make most of your listeners and fans cringe and say that I'm not an X-Men fan um so I was very hesitant to Hoxbox and it was actually over quarantine when I started because it had ended by that time so people were starting to talk about it there were no spoilers um People were openly talking about it. I discovered your page uh, and I started learning more about what the story entailed. And I was like, okay, I can, I can do this. And by that time the book had come out. So I went to uh, Barnes and Nobles, ordered the book uh, and started that. So I'm still kind of catching up on the events that happened after um, House and Powers. But yeah, what what did you think initially when it was revealed that Moira was a mutant? See, at first I thought it was just me being that (laughs) tight knit, like hold it close to my chest. Yeah. Um, I still stand behind the fact that I don't like it, but I've come to terms with the fact that it was not me just being a stick in the mud. Uh, I genuinely think that what made Moira who she was and what made her a vital part of the X-Men books and to our community is that she was the ally. Yeah. Yeah. And absolutely ally right. is so important. It's so important to have allyship and to um, have that representation, have show what it's like to not be, Oh, you know, we, we don't mind mutants. And obviously I'm drawing a parallel to the LGBTQ plus community. Um, It was so important to see a character that was quote unquote normal, a cisgendered straight woman, um, a non-mutant, be an advocate for those that were different and use her platform and use her, her education to fight for that. And I thought it was really important to have. So to have her be a mutant sort of, diminished her allyship uh, and I stand by that but I'm very happy to have had the stories of her growing up um, it just 
It's and you know what? In two years, it'll be retconned and. <laughs> Two years, it'll be Retcon and Wanda and Pietro will be Magneto's children again. Um, again they never stopped. <laughs> yeah, my headcanon is that they never stopped. I agree with you. It's funny. I Hoxpox for me was a breath of fresh air because I've been reading the books religiously since high school. You know, I've gone to the comic book store every week. I mean, I may have faltered uh, maybe my last like, year of high school and then like first year of college. But then by my sophomore year of college, I was back in like reading everything uh, every week. But I, the X-Men, like that relaunch that you were talking about before Hawks Box, which was Uncanny X-Men, it was, it was rough, girl. It was so rough. And when we got to Hawks Box, it was really well done. So I was able to digest some of the information, like Moira being a mutant, a bit easier because shit had been so weird. And I don't want to throw hate to any writer because it's difficult to sit down and plot out a weekly comic, which is what uncanny X-Men was, but it was such a change in tone and shift that I just accepted it and was happy. It was after Hawks Pox that I've sort of had difficulties accepting the X-Men for their current status quo, just because at like at a certain point, I think like Hickman and I've said this before, he, he writes really great, like grand stories, but then his characters can be a little stiff. And I think he's gone in so much better, especially with other writers like Leah Williams, Denny Howard, Cy Spurrier. They've really loosened him up a little bit, but that was sort of, it was after Hawks Box, where I was like, oh, kind of missing like the old 90s vibe. You know what I mean? But I think the X books are front and center now. And I think it's only a matter of time before they hit the MCU. And- yep. They're working into that with the multiverse. So. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's happening. So who is your favorite X-Man? Well, one of the reasons I'm so excited to be on this episode in particular is uh, my, my probably like what really got me into the X-Men was finding that VHS of Pride of the X-Men. I love Tyler. Pride of the X-Men. So, which is what the video game was based off. Yes. Of, but then they completely revamped the animated series. Uh, Kitty is my favorite. And I know it's not many people's favorites. Uh, and she's kind of the, the underdog in the run of the family. And I think that's why I like her. Oh, my God. And she uh, was the, the, the new kid. And she was uh, a mutant. And she was Jewish. And they talked about that. Um, so yeah, I, I took right to her. She had a pet again. She was so cool. She was eighties, like know. realness, right? <laughs> With her right. hair, her Alan Davis hair. I mean, that came later, yeah. obviously. But what, what story in particular of Kitty do you love so much? So I held on to Pride of the X Men for a long time because I, I like love Pride so much, uh, and I really wasn't like getting into her comic wise until Excalibur oh, yeah. it's just it's I mean like, that I, blue so, outfit yes uh, I mean she like she would have been in an aerobics Olivia Newton-John video <laughs> <laughs> I mean honestly and she kind of looked like Elizabeth Shue and I'm a huge fan of adventures in babysitting yeah that's so, that's so funny I think I just knocked figures over. Oh, wow. oh, don't worry. My figures have been falling over all day. Look, actually, Storm <laughs> is on the floor. Or not on the floor. She just fell over. Dude, I had a Wanda statue like up there, and she tumbled over. And like her hair and her crown like cracked. I'm so like heartbroken. Oh. It's like now I have Demon Lamp, Jamie Hewlett's, and Thanos up there. But um I so I love Pride of the X-Men. I love the Toei animation. Of course, Toei does or does Sailor Moon. They still do Sailor Moon. I think it looks beautiful. I was just watching it today because we did a Colossus Spotlight and I pulled some clips from it. It's mm -hmm. gorgeous. I don't even... We spoke with Larry Houston, who was the uh, X-Men animated series director, but he also worked on Pride of the X-Men. I'm forgetting what his title was, but for lack of a better... He was like one of three directors. He may have been the storyboard artist slash director, but he... Talked about like Pride of the X-Men. He thought there were some failures in it. I look at Pride of the X-Men. It's fucking perfect. You know, I. Yeah. I like it. To the point where I, 
I full on know and have known and did know that Wolverine was Canadian. And when they cast Hugh Jackman, I legitimately was like, oh, they're going <laughs> out of the X-Men. They got an Australian. I'm into it. Yes. Like, yeah. I didn't even care that he had an Australian accent. I, I didn't care him. either. And, and I, I know. In an Australian accent. And Emma's voice, too, apparently, like, you know, she sounds like kind of weird, but I love it when she's like, men are so helpless against the awesome powers of the White Queen. Right. And she's like, Magneto, your deliverance is at hand. And she throws like the psychic. It doesn't make sense. I get it. But like, it's amazing. Loved it. Loved every minute of it. Poor Emma. She never gets a British accent. I know. Like any of her iterations. Oh, I don't know. I have feels on January Jones and all that, but... Wait, did she have an accent in uh, Wolverine and the X Men? Can't remember her voice in it. I think she I may know. have. They tried to do astonishing style, and we had astonishing. I know. So I didn't bother. Um, before we hit astonishing, just a couple more questions, general mm-hmm. questions to gain to know you. Uh, which X Man do you think still needs a Marvel Legends? I mean, would it be cheating to say an entire Excalibur box set? No, it's not cheating at all. And <laughs> hopefully that's happening. Hopefully that is happening. I think the right? the fellas have hinted at that on Instagram. We, you know, I really, I really would love. For my own selfish purposes, I would love, obviously, Excalibur Kitty. Uh, and I would love them to redo the astonishing team because that was kind of in Hasbro's initial dive into Marvel Legends when it wasn't so great. Um, that Cat Beast. Well, wait, Cat Beast. I Cat think Beast was wasn't bad. X Men Legends. That was still Toy Biz. Emma. No, that was that was Hasbro. Oh, it was Hasbro. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. So wait, the Toy Biz did one. Wait, do I have Wolverine? One? They had, yeah, they did an astonishing beast, full up astonishing beast. But I think X Men Legends, when like the X three came out, they were doing those waves. I think they did a cat beast face with like a, a stealth outfit, yeah, like some like a stealth outfit. But I forgot about that astonishing beast Marvel Legends that Hasbro did until now. That was fucking ugly. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't as bad as Emma, but and like Dwight. Is like this is what she was supposed to look like, and always like flashes that photo where she looked beautiful, but just me. I I I was friends with Sam Hatmaker, who used to work at um, Toy Biz. I used to work at Marvel back in two thousand and six, so I became friends with Sam Hatmaker, and he had told me that they had been planning Emma for the Legends wave, and that their inspiration for Emma was Marsha Cross. And so when I see that figure, all I yeah. see is Marsha Cross from Desperate Housewives. And I love Marsha Cross. I loved her in Melrose Place. I loved yeah. her in Desperate Housewives. Everything else she's done, I think she's absolutely fabulous. But she was an Emma in my head, you know? See, I thought when I saw her, I was like, oh, they're going with, uh, uh, what's her name? Oh, actually, the only British iteration from the made-for-TV movie Generation X. Fanola Hughes. A goddess. <laughs> I love, I mean, that. I can't. And I would see that in that Marvel Legends because of the, like the jet black eyebrows. Oh, good point. I didn't even think about that. Strong cheekbone. Strong I was, I, I felt the figure got better when they did the true diamond exclusive. I think she looked better. Okay. <laughs> Mm. okay (laughs) but finola hughes goddess and we had some of the actors from the generation x movie we had heather mccomb and randall slavin we had jeremy who was banshee and we have another one coming up which i'm really excited for and hopefully finola one day i don't know maybe she's she's also patty halliwell so i think i would die if I don't think I would have any Emma <laughs> questions for her. I'd be talking to her about Charmed because <laughs> I'm nuts. Um, the movies. What did you think of the movies, the X movies? You know, we really, when we look back, we can pick them apart. Um, mm-hmm. But X-Men 
honestly made superhero movies what they are today. Yep. We needed to, if we had released Avengers in 2000, uh, it wouldn't have flown. No, I agree. It was all about trying to base them in the real world. Could we have stuck with more traditional storylines? Absolutely. I a hundred percent agree with that. Um, But again, the wonderful thing about X-Men and Marvel comics is that there are so many different universes, multiverses, iterations of these characters uh, that there's something for everyone. And this was just a different telling of it. And they made it, they tried to make it more grounded and based in real life. I think that it touched on a lot of issues of um, racism and homophobia in the country. Uh, political, human rights, civil rights, uh, they addressed those. So I'm happy that they kept those in. And that really is the heart of X-Men. So they kept the heart. Um, and you could tell they were getting larger budgets as it went. I think by three, they just lost it with, you know, here's a budget. Don't really focus on the storyline. Yeah. So the next question was going to be about X3 because obviously they wanted to do Dark Phoenix, but they were like, no, we need to have another plot. And it's the Cure plot, which was relatively new at the time because of Astonishing X-Men. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think, you know, what's really sad about X3 is if you go in and watch just the Cure parts, I actually like, and we're going to talk about how much of a astonishing fan I am. I actually like the portrayal and idea of the cure in X3 over its plot line in astonishing. Oh, interesting. I think there are just other plot holes and poor storytelling throughout the movie that diminishes the importance of that storyline. They addressed things in a very, very realistic way. Um, we're probably, since we're talking about Astonishing and the Cure, we're probably going to talk about it a lot. I don't know how long this takes to, to air, but we're filming on June 28th, which is <laughs> the day that started uh, the civil riots and really what kicked off pride and, and civil rights within the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, and that an X3 is, was such an important movie because it was a superhero movie that, in, that addressed um, so, I mean, it's so relevant. Anyone, I, I encourage you all to go watch X3 and look at the scene where the mutants are lined up to get the cure and tell me how it doesn't mirror what you're watching on the news with the, the COVID vaccinations. It's so relevant on how divided a country we are. And you can put it with racism, homophobia, the, the virus. You can slap it religion. You can, you can slap it on anything and watch how relative those scenes in particular are. Blaine, I literally have chills because <laughs> I, when I went to go get my first vaccine, I kind of like got out of my Uber and there was like crowds of people. I had to get it at um, the Meadowlands and literally there were crowds of people trying to get an appointment. The security guard was there and I, I had an appointment and I like literally, I felt like Roe getting off like the van yeah. and just walking, like putting on my hoodie. Cause it was also cold. It was like end of March, early April. And I agree with you. I thought about that scene as well. And I never pieced it together that thematically that could be emblematic of exactly everything you just said, COVID, you know, LGBTQIA plus rights, religion, everything. It's right there. And yeah, I agree with that. So let's dive into Astonishing X-Men and we and we can run around with X3 and how it was adapted and everything. So for those of you who don't know, Astonishing X-Men came out in 2004, was written by Joss Whedon and art by John Cassidy. And this was a book that was being published during the Reloaded era. New X-Men had just come to an end. The mutants were set to inherit the Earth. That was a big plot point in Morrison's. Magneto slash Zorn had already been killed by Wolverine. Jean was dead, killed by Magneto slash Zorn. Scott and Emma were together, and the professor had retired to go teach in Genosha. And Astonishing X-Men was seen as the spiritual successor to New X-Men. 
It was the flagship title. The X-Men were done with the black leather outfits and they were coming back to being more superheroes. And this, I believe, was after Avengers Disassembled, but before House of M and before Phoenix Endsong. So the X-Men were in a really interesting place where they were set to inherit the Earth and then something like The Cure kind of came in. And so that's sort of where we begin volume one of Astonishing X-Men. And Blaine, I'm just curious, what are your overall feels for this, for these first six issues? Is it six? Uh, yeah, it's first six issues. Starting to read that, uh, I had two major feels. First and foremost was The Cure. Mm -hmm. For very similar reasons that I was saying with X3, uh, it, was, it was bringing me back to what I loved with X-Men. I gave up after New X-Men. Uh, the storylines kind of went away from what the core, what it means, what X-Men means. And I didn't really like many of the storylines, so I gave up. Um, it seems like it seemed like when Morrison's run ended, um, th there was no pickup. It just ended and people went their own direction. And I was like, wait, this doesn't, none of this makes sense. Um, so when that went astonishing, when I heard it was going to be continuation, I picked it up and my initial thoughts, because it begins with the addressment of the cure. And uh, I was like, wait, this has nothing to do with new X-Men. And then they started, which Whedon rest his mortal soul. Uh, <laughs> with, <laughs> um, he is really great at storytelling and kind of character interaction. Yep. And um there's a level of camp he has that it, it's campy, but it's very realistic. I can't quite explain it. It, it works. It works. I call it the weed and humor. That's because okay. I was a huge Buffy fan, huge angel yeah. fan, firefly. Yeah. It's campy, but it's so serious. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and relative. And when the team is talking about, why they are assembling this new team and um, you know, they're kind of, they're kind of literally going against the X-Men movies because by that time we had established that, that live action could be comic booky mm -hmm. um, and they are, you know, there were direct lines that combated the first X-Men movie where what would you expect blue spandex or yellow <laughs> spandex and then in Astonishing, they're like, you know, people want to see superheroes. They don't want to see black leather. Yeah. So they like, were directly, you know, and it was so cleverly done. And they were poking fun at what the X-Men had become and kind of saying, this is the comic that's going to continue a very real storyline and give old school X-Men fans exactly what they want. And they really did do that. They gave us realistic X-Men the way the movies gave us. And they gave us good old fashioned blue and yellow spandex. We love that blue and yellow spandex so much. I um, mean, they hit, you know, Wolverine, like they were like, we're going to, we're going to make you recognize Wolverine. Yeah. Kitty. We're going to make you recognize those classic new mutant suits. Yeah. Well, yeah. and even Emma for, she was given her diamond form. I think Morrison, they had said that they wanted Emma to pop on screen. And so I never thought she really did pop on screen or excuse me, not screen, you know, panel mm -hmm. during new X-Men. But when I was rereading this for our episode, I was like, Oh, Emma does pop. And I think that's a testament to Cassidy's art. Yeah. Like when she's in her diamond form, like mm -hmm. there is Emma Frost. You can find her on the page. Yeah. You know, in terms of Whedon, I think let, let's just address it. I, I'm a huge Buffy fan. I'm a huge Angel fan. I, I loved Astonishing when it came out. This was a book that I remember when it was delayed towards the end, like the shipping schedule had been off. I was so angry because I was like, this is the best book ever. I eventually did get to chat with Whedon when I was at Wizard Magazine, and he was a total asshole to me. He was just not kind. And obviously, recently, we know he's very problematic with everything Charisma Carpenter has said with Ray Fisher. So, you know, I've always been 
historically reluctant to talk about astonishing X-Men because I, I feel it very personal for me because I, I saw firsthand he really was a douche. But I think as we were discussing before we hit record, so much goes into comic book production. There was John Cassidy is a wonderful artist. The editorial team, Nick Lowe is a good guy. He was a great editor, production letterist. So I think looking at this as a culmination of so much hard work, you really do appreciate Astonishing for that. And I don't think something like what Whedon did, which is terrible, should eclipse all the hard work everyone else put into this. Right. And I don't like to give, um, you know, Whedon as a person credit. Obviously, I credit him for like the parts of the storytelling that he did. Uh, but when it comes to that, I, I say the same thing about Harry Potter. I think the message in these books and the message in the Harry Potter books, um, the message outweighs and outspeaks oh, yeah. the author. And when when the message can drown out the author, I think that reading the message and reading the material is important. Um, you know, there are kids who got through very hard times with X-Men. There are kids who got through very hard times with Harry Potter. There are kids who got through hard times with Buffy. Um, so the amount of people that the books, not the, not the authors helped, I focus on that. Um, and if they were making big profit off of things and, and Disney or Marvel or, uh, whoever uh, in charge was allowing them to continue stories, I'd be more outspoken about it. And I probably wouldn't read the books. Um, but, you know, it was already written. Those shows were already filmed. They gave great voices. The sad thing about Whedon is he really was able to give women very powerful voices, which yeah. is so mind boggling to me um, that I almost with Buffy in particular, um, the reason I say like, yes, I'll still watch that. Oh, but it was Whedon. Right. But it, they were powerful women. Yeah. They were still allowed to be powerful women with whatever was going on behind the scenes. If we weren't to continue to watch and read these powerful women, what would that have done for Sarah Michelle um, and well, any other star who was treated ill by this man? Um, it would have been in vain. They persevered through that exactly. to amazing content. So I'm going to honor them and represent them. And in Astonishing, he he does write my favorite mutant. Or <laughs> she's such a powerful woman. And it was another powerful woman uh, empowering another powerful woman, the, the Emma Kitty kind of thing. Um, so I focus on that. You know, I focus on the, the stories of these women. I, I agree wholeheartedly with everything you said. And I'm sorry, I'm just looking at you in awe because I could literally hear you continue <laughs> talking. But yes, I, I, opinions. I no, I that's exactly why we wanted you here tonight. But I agree 1000%. And with that being said, I love the intro scene with your girl. When oh. she walks in, she's here like, this place has been destroyed. It's been rebuilt, but I don't see the brood. I don't see any of that. All I see are shards of me. And it's all like these ghostly images of her calling professor Xavier a jerk, kissing Colossus, excuse me, kissing Colossus for the first time. And it's just so beautiful. You feel the weight yeah. of what the mansion means to Kitty. Yep. Yeah. It's everything that any good sequel has ever been it's the reintroduction of characters that you know and love mm -hmm. it's the reminiscing to tie you in from its origin story and then it's the look how far they've come yeah every good sequel introduces characters in that way um and it was just it was perfectly done to how did you feel about Cassidy's art with Kitty because that opening shot where she's looking up and remembering everything it's gorgeous. Yeah. I love, love, love Cassidy's art. Um, like love. There's something like that right uh, there. Look at that. Uh, it's gorgeous. There's something about the way he draws women in particular that shows um, that you don't need to be. And I'm not knocking Jim Lee. Uh, obviously, he was a huge inspiration to me. 
Um, but you know, the, the body shapes, the unrealistic body shapes, um, that was what comics were for men and women characters. Um, but Cassidy does this wonderful thing of drawing women as kind of these more realistically shaped while also keeping it very comic book, very classic comic book. Um, almost like you're reading. I think, I think he is. And I think astonishing this run of astonishing is what kicked off kind of that whole new old look of comics where they started doing that retro style um, because he has this kind of very classic uh, newspaper comic strip style to him, but then he draws these powerful women and it helps with the story of powerful women. He draws them not overly busty and cinched waist. They're thicker. They've got real bodies. Um, I, I love it. I love well, it. And even Kitty's like body language and position when she phases through the wall and she's at the assembly and she goes up to Emma and she's here like, I'm sorry, I was busy putting on all my clothes. Kitty, and I, cause I was th- that age when I first read this, she looked like a recent college graduate who was 22, you know, it's kind of like slumpy, you know, her hair's just, you know, flat. She's wearing like the layers of clothes. And then there's Emma, you know, who looks like a fucking beautiful superhero, Amazon, whatever. And the contrast in that scene, and I noticed it this time around. I was like, wow, like Cassidy just understood what made a character, a character, not only from a general perspective, but at a certain point in their life. And Emma, again, is coming out of New X-Men where she was more like, I don't want to say supporting cast by any means, but she wasn't the head of the Xavier school. And then here's Emma with the blowout, like the fucking beautiful cape for her costume. Like he nailed it 100%. And like you said, but even the contrast where Kitty was uh, kind of more bright eyed and Mm -hmm. Emma he always kind of drew her with this resting bitch face. Her, her eyelids were always like half shut. Um, she kind of had like, almost, she was like, like sucking in her cheeks. Like she was about to like click her tongue. Oh, or yes. Oh, look like right here too. Like, look at that. See, it's, it's perfect. It's right there. The he just nailed it. And like, man, like even like when Emma was sleeping with Cyclops, mm-hmm. like right there, It's just, yeah, I think the art is so kinetic and it's so wonderful. And I think Astonishing X-Men, again, just really set some, set up the era, the Reloaded era. And I know, you know, we, a lot of people look back and they're like, oh, the Reloaded era. I, I don't think it was as bad as some of the other eras that we got later on, but I think we got that wit, you know, in Emma and Kitty and that dichotomy between them. Like I love the, in issue one where they're sitting in the danger room and they're talking about like, why are they here? And Kitty's like, so I'm sorry, like what? I'm a PR stunt. And Emma's like, yes, our own little PR stunt, the non-threatening shadow cat or Ariel or Sprite or whatever incredibly unimpressive name you're going by today. Yep. The banter, the banter is everything. I, I don't know how to articulate you didn't get that wasn't standard for comic books. Right. You know, that yeah. that language was not standard. It, it coupled with the art, coupled with the positioning. It was yeah. just extremely unique. Coupled with like tying it's not like they were just newly writing these characters. Like you were reading this banter and how she kind of thinks she's above Kitty, and then a few pages later to have Kitty again, that's what makes a great sequel. Um, to really hit your heartstrings and remember. And even if you weren't a fan of the comics, going back to Pride of the X-Men, because I didn't know this the first time I read Astonishing. Um, she was like, the, the, the very first day I joined the X-Men, the very first day I was introduced to evil and it was your face. And she says something about like, um, watch you, Emma, I can smell you. I know. And I hadn't, I hadn't read uh, like Kitty's first issue at that time. I had to go back and read it. But having watched Pride of the X-Men and knowing that Kitty's first day was when the Brotherhood broke into the mansion and yeah. stole Cerebro, I was like, oh, snap. Like I immediately tied it to my childhood. And I was like, wow, knowing how old I am now and knowing when I first watched Pride of the X-Men, I was like, damn, there is years, years 
of resentment and shade. And it made it that yeah. telling of a story. Of it. And it, it was so wonderful because I remember, dude, it, it's so funny. We're on the same page because I remember when I first read it, I had the same exact thing. Cause I, I, so Kitty and the comic books first came in during the dark Phoenix saga when she, when Emma had abducted the X-Men stripped them, caged them, you know what Kitty says. Mm-hmm. I, I had read parts of the dark Phoenix saga at that point, but again, didn't have the internet, don't have digital issues. So I, when I went back and I read it, it was like, oh my God, there's so much weight here in those stories. And I, I thought the same thing. I was like, wow, like Kitty has gone through so much Excalibur, Extreme X-Men at the time. She was just coming off of Extreme X-Men. And I remember thinking like, wow, she really hates Emma. Like, and that makes sense. She first met them during the Dark Phoenix saga. Emma grabbed these people that Kitty was looking up to, stripped them, put them in a cage, and that has stayed with her. And she fucking hates Emma. And that is just like, boom. And then to top it all off, that's the whole reason Emma hired her. Yes! Yes! Like, bitch, what? It, like, that it's just so one of the things from that scene i just want to point out because i think we'll talk about it a little later is kitty's like i don't know why i'm here and then the, of course that's where cyclops is like you're a pr stunt blah 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 and emma's like you know it throws a shade but so we get the announcement of the cure at the end as they the astonishing team is assembling to go take on ord who i don't know if i picked it up this time around i maybe i could have told you like 15 years ago why why is he Robbie in this gala? I mean, I know it's a diversion, but like he just comes in with goons and he's, you know, ho- holding everyone hostage because why not? He's evil. And the X-Men are like, well, we see an opportunity here, so let's go to this gala. Um, but I thought it was it was such a great end to that first issue because you think the X-Men are going to go off and be heroes and actually know they found a cure for what Dr. Rao was saying, like, oh, it's a cellular, you know, disease. Mm-hmm. It took what the X Men mean and made a new story, and and really, again, I'm I'm gonna align it with kind of what's going on in the world with civil rights, um, you know, gay rights, um, Black Lives Matter, uh, everything. Every marginalized person, um, any minority can relate to the X-Men in some way. And then on top of it, to not only bring back the the, uh, core X-Men, like uh, what it means to to be X-Men and and, um, be different and fight for equality and equity in a world that fears and hates you, then to on top of it, introduce not only this cure idea of what would the world do if they had a cure to let's say being gay, but what would our community do yeah. at the opportunity to be accepted by everyone, be normal? Yeah. Uh, it did exactly what X-Men supposed to do. Well, and we saw that obviously with, in the movie, it was Rogue. Mm-hmm. And in this, in this comic, it was, it was Beast. Yeah. The ending with Rogue. The one that made it, you know, obviously they filmed like two alternate endings, one where she had the cure and one where she didn't, you know, I think Brett Ratner, I don't think fully digested the minority symbolism with X-Men and why it would be dangerous to have an ending like that. But then on the other hand, you know, you are talking about a character who, if she touches someone, she will literally kill them. Right. I mean, and, and Rogue wasn't developed in the way she was developed in the comic book. But I still remember seeing that ending and being so angry that Rogue had taken the cure. Yeah, go. No, this is, BB, this is why you're here. Please say it. So I completely see what you mean. And I had those thoughts as well. Um, and the reason I actually love that it was beast in the comics is that it was a little more obvious Mm -hmm. um, how someone who looks different might be more inclined again 
today is Pride Day. We, we talk about uh, Marsha P. Johnson, who was one of the the founders um, for people who were uh, fighting for for gay rights at Stonewall during the riots, during the protests. Um, and she was a black trans woman. And the reason I like Beast is it's it kind of throws it in your face the mm-hmm. obviousness of oh well if you if you looked different, if you couldn't walk outside, if you were a person of color, uh, if you were a non-passing trans person, yeah. uh, you know, you would be more inclined. And to go back to the ending of the movie where a lot of people are kind of upset at the message of Rogue, it is teaching, let's say, gay people. Um, it is kind of sending out that wrong message. You should You should be proud, but not every X-Men needs to represent a gay man. Storm was the gay man in X3. Oh, Storm yeah. was the one that, because we shouldn't have to, right? Rogue wasn't the gay man. Maybe Rogue was a pre-op trans person. Think about it. She couldn't, you know, she's got this power where she um, doesn't want to be intimate with her boyfriend. Mm-hmm. And I think that's something that maybe a lot of trans kids could relate to. They don't want to be intimate with a partner because they are embarrassed about maybe the parts that they still have. They don't feel like the person they are inside because of what uh, a physical thing, uh, you know, what they were born with. Um, so in that respect, imagine how empowering that storyline might be to a trans kid who uh, wants to be able to be intimate with their partner and finally has the courage when the opportunity arises to um, transition. So, so Rogue, in a way, uh, wasn't a gay person getting the cure to not, it, it wasn't a gay person going to conversion therapy, but was a pre-op trans person who finally made the decision to, you know, take a cure and be their authentic self and be able to enjoy the life that, that they see that they want. I, I love that interpretation so much. Well, it needs to be for everyone, you know, yeah, yeah. for everyone and represent everyone. So I, so I get, I get your point as a gay yeah. man, like, you don't want to take it, but there was beast. There was storm. There were yeah. all these other people who are um, that, Yeah. And, and, you know, it's the conversation on LGBTQIA plus rights and, and, and civil rights and, and people of color in in the country back in 2006 was vastly different from where it is today. Mm-hmm. And I think it has evolved in such a way that we can look back on these narratives and we can we can draw those parallels in the way that you just did. You know, because those conversations weren't happening. And I think my only resentment for really like the macro of it was that Brett Ratner notoriously, you know, bullied Elliot Page. I think the stories had come out after X3 that Elliot Page had been bullied by Brett Ratner Mm -hmm. and that he had used the F word somewhere. I'm forgetting what kind of panel. And so I was like, did you ever, because the way you just described it, I'd be like, yes, absolutely. 100% agree. I can digest that, but I don't know. And I don't know him. I I don't want to speak for anyone or any of their evolution, but like knowing those two things about someone who's handling the X-Men seemed like a spit in my face as, as a viewer. And like, did you really, here's my thing. Did you really put the thought into that symbolism or was it like rogue is a girl who just wants to have sex? You know what I mean? Like what, what was the thought behind it? And, and so, so that's where I was coming at in 2006, but I think because we can evolve as a society and we are at a point where conversations like this matter and they're important and we need to move beyond what we've traditionally thought about narratives, especially with the X-Men and right. all the kinds of different people we have. We can look back on this and we can put that in there because as you said, these stories and those messages drown out any negativity that the creators put. So You, you take the power back. That's yeah. why uh, people of color use the N-word. Um, for each other that's why sorry my dog is wanting to say no hello. it's okay we're oh my god hi what's your dog's name this is president laura roslin of the 12 colonies of man what we call her roslin hey roslin you know you were my favorite character in battlestar galactica that's her I'm so sorry. much 
oh. life. <laughs> I cried like a little baby. So much. Oh. I still think of, I'm sorry, I was going to go on a BSG tangent. That's for the spinoff podcast. Continue. We, we can do that too. Go, uh, continue. <laughs> oh gosh, what was I talking about? We got distracted by puppies. Puppy. Oh. Oh, not just any puppy. <laughs> President Laura Roslin right? of the 12 Colonies. Right. But, um, you know, that's, it's taking the, taking the power back. Uh, that's why, uh, you know, there are black people who use the N word, uh, with each other. That's why there are gay people who use the F word with each other. Um, it's, it could very well have been, uh, the author's intent to diminish or to have their own way or their own agenda. Uh, but the story gets to drown it out and we get to take the power back by saying, if you look at it this way it helps empower someone who's marginalized. Um, so I choose to look at it not to cover up uh, misogyny, but mm-hmm. to take the power back away from misogyny. Yeah. No, that is being, well, like, you know, when you see, uh, I've been doing a lot of pride posts and you have these like straight people who say these homophobic things, uh, comment on my photos and then you go to their page and they've got Harley Quinn and Loki and Deadpool and I get to take the power back and, what are you doing posting them then you're giving your, you're buying LGBTQIA plus characters. Uh, so in your face. Yeah. Take that back. Yeah. I, I love that so much. I, I really do. Power of X-Men. Take the power, power of, X-Men. of X-Men right there. Take it back. Um, okay. So beast wants to take the cure. Eventually we find out that the body they're running the test on uh, the cure on is a body, a DNA sample that we know. And he goes to tell Cyclops and Emma and Cyclops automatically is like, it's Gene. And so we are led Dead to or something or there was a line there. That was great. But yeah. yeah. He's here, like, why don't, why doesn't anything stay buried? And Cyclops is like, Gene. And then like Emma's looking all shocked. And of course we were talking about this as well before we hit record Back in like 2004, Marvel released the Phoenix Ruse, which was a page by John Cassidy where Cyclops is running through, you know, the laboratory and the caption says something to the effect of uh, when you're not even shocked or even surprised. And then it's him facing Gene and the Phoenix effect. And I remember seeing that and I remember thinking it was Gene and obviously it's not. And it was Colossus. So how did you deal with that surprise when your favorite character has this huge emotional plot point where she finds Colossus? And I, I want to say the way it was also written was there she is. And she's like, if you're a clone alternate universe, I can deal with it. But if you're someone fucking with me, I will kill you. Mm. And it was just so beautifully done. So it's not even just a surprise. It was how it was executed. Yep. Executed. Oh. <laughs> uh, my reaction was uh, perfectly drawn uh, by, by John Cassidy because I read it and I did exactly what Kitty did. I was just like, and then the next panel, chest, hand on chest. It, it was, it was perfect. It was anyone who was a fan of this couple. That was the reaction. That was the exact perfect reaction. Everything happened exactly the way it should have been. And then she like, and then to have him turn around and just drop to the floor, like, holy shit. And he's here like, am I finally dead? And he just like hugs her. Ugh. Ugh. And it was so great because then obviously at the end, she's speaking to him at the end of volume one, excuse me, they're outside of the mansion and she looks at him and she goes, I think it's why I'm here when oh. she's talking about his return and everything. So we have that answer as to why Kitty's there or she finally got that answer. Yeah. And I just, I, I don't know. I don't want to say I didn't grow up with the Kitty Colossus romance. I didn't know what was at stake as a reader until I got to read astonishing and understand their relationship, because I think they stopped 
dating after Secret Wars, the first one, perhaps. And then, of course, I knew because I had read whatever I had read um, that there was a relationship, but I never really saw them together. And then he died in the mid 90s because he was doing the cure for um, the legacy virus. And it was a beautiful way he died. He said, Snowflake, I'm coming home in reference to Eliana who had died. And, and, and then Kitty had kind of like moved on and she spread his ashes. And by the way, and that was another scene that got me when she's here, like, I know you were dead because I spread your ashes and Colossus just like, you did. Thank you. Right. And it was beautiful. And again, like you were saying, like I was able to draw a line back to a previous issue. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's just so there this really was Kitty's book. It and was Kitty's book. It gave, her, it gave her everything she needed to be a strong, independent woman. And it mm-hmm. gave everything um, that she needed to, everything that she needed to show us that she had grown up. Yeah. Right. She was fighting back the people that she was too intimidated to fight back to or to stand up to. She's loving the person that she thought she had missed her chance with. Um, and then she's inevitably sacrificing for the greater good. It, it just shows that this child has become uh, a leader at such a young age. Uh, and, and you don't think about it when you're reading it because it's a cute love story. But when you look at it overall, yeah. uh, just every nuance of this book showed um, just how grown up she had become. And everything that we loved about her character throughout the years um, had a hand in creating this, this like, this was my kitty finale. I, I, I was so pissed at the ending when it happened. Um, and then I was like, but you know what? This was like the grand finale. Like they, yeah. th- this was her, her peak moment. Well, I re- I was at wizard when astonishing was coming to an end and I was speaking to one of the writers and we were, I was wrapping up a story and he was here like, Oh yeah, I just got off a call with Marvel and I know how astonishing is going to end. Someone's going to die. And I was like, who is it going to be? And he wrote kitty, you know, on oh. like the notebook. And I was just like, no, but I was like, but that makes sense. Like it makes perfect sense because this was supposed to be her story. And, and by the way, and I know, Listeners, my apologies. I know we're skipping way ahead from volume one and hopefully we'll have Flame back again to discuss the other parts. Oh, of yeah. Astonishing. But we, we can see where Emma and Kitty's relationship begins in this book and where it ends when Emma's like, Kitty, I can put you in a state where you don't have to be afraid or in pain when she's fused with the bullet. And Kitty's like, no, I'm going to feel it. Are you disappointed, Miss, Miss Frost? And Emma replies, going, astonish Miss Pride. Uh, Beautiful. It's beautiful. Everything, everything. And that even goes to even the people, um, you know, even the people that hurt you and the people that abuse you. There's something sick about the human psyche and you still want to know that you got their approval in the end. Mm hmm. Uh, so ev- everything it like a psycho I, like I, I feel like Whedon didn't write this and he just hired a psychologist to write it <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> well you know there there was a rumor for a while there that maybe there was a ghostwriter you know I don't know I don't want to comment on any of that so but I, I have a couple more questions before we wrap the episode that I do want to point out for Astonishing X-Men I want your feels on Emma do you think the X-Men are right to distrust Emma, because even back then I was like, yo, she, she was in Generation X for years. She was on New X-Men. I get it that she's a morally gray character, but I feel like she proved herself. And I know obviously the end, we end on the note that, oh, she's up to something, you know, foreshadowing the torn arc. But I don't know. I, I remember thinking like, she's proven herself. Like Emma's not bad. She's not a bad character. And nor do I think she's going to, this story will culminate with her becoming a villain again. Yeah. You know, I liked that it was real life. Um, Not every character distrusted her. There were characters that had worked alongside of her for, for years now, and they seemed to be okay and trusting of her. 
Um, then there were characters like Kitty who had not worked with her and who were very distrusting of her based on what they knew of her um, and hadn't seen the evolution of this person. And in real life, when you throw that tiny little wrench in of this person who's going to start asking questions, well, then it gets other people's wheels turning. Oh, and that's a very valid question. point. Um, so I don't think that ever that she was really distrusted so much in the book. Um, but I think, again, she brought Kitty to do exactly what she brought Kitty to do. Uh, and Kitty did just that. She questioned and she allowed other people to make educated guesses because she had said something about kind of throwing shade at Emma and, and, and talking about the fact that Scott just seemed to be over Jean and, and Kitty wasn't around in new X-Men. She didn't see the, the relationship and the starting of the emotional affair. Um, so she walks in and suddenly the guy that has always been in love with Jean is now like happily with this other woman. And, uh, you know, she, and this woman can control people's minds. It's so funny that you said that because there was, I'm looking for the beat in the story um, that I was like, Oh, they are actually, probably trying to mislead the the reader or they are dropping a hint that Emma's mind control him later on in like, I think it was like the utopian era. It, it was firmly established that Cyclops could not get mentally controlled by anyone because Gene had taught him. And it's, you know, he had mentioned that several times, but at, at this point in the story, something like that had never really been introduced, but I'm just trying to find it really quickly because I saw that and he said something, so it's this scene right here where Emma's talking and she goes, Scott? And he goes, oh, yeah, I agree. And it's such a, and look at her side eye there. Yep. You know, and then when they dismiss a team, they mention the mind control thing. And that it's kind of like a funny beat in the story where she's here, like, you'll never see me naked again. Mm -hmm. But I get that. I get that wholeheartedly that Kitty would walk in and be like, this person who has deceived the x-men before i'm coming back she's in charge now and the guy exactly what you said when i first joined the x-men i saw he could not get over the fact gene died and now he's just over her that's it and now he's with emma and wolverine's not buying it you know they're getting into a fight on the lawn so yeah that's a very valid that's a very valid perspective and who did, you know, Wolverine was around in New X-Men, so he saw the evolution of Emma, but yeah. one of his, like, oldest friends comes back, and, you know, Kitty and, and Logan trust, I love the Shadowcat storyline, and uh, Logan and, and Kitty trust each other. They have such a tight bond. It's almost like they replaced Kitty with Rogue in the movies for that kind of... Yeah, that, that point of view character. Um and Jubilee in the animated series was basically yeah. a stand-in for Kitty. Yeah. And I believe we spoke with Larry Houston and the Lee Walds, and I believe Kitty was purposely not used because of Pride of the X-Men. Yeah. Which is yeah. sad because, you know, I, I understand Jubilee was at that point the comic book character who was Wolverine's sidekick and the point of view character, but I think Kitty should have been in there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm happy with Jubilee. Uh, she, she, became the kitty of the nineties. Yeah. Uh, and kitty would come back in X-Men evolution. She did. <laughs> <laughs> Where she was a Valley girl. Oh, the early two thousands. Wait. So before we end our talk on astonishing, the only thing I really wanted to point out was the evolution of Cyclops from Morrison's, which they had written him as sort of this traumatized individual who was questioning everything about his life after Apocalypse had possessed him to now finally reclaiming that leadership role. And they don't have the professor anymore. They don't have no one to fall back on. This is on Scott and he's responsible for the team right now. And I'm curious what you thought of his evolution from new X-Men to astonishing. And Again, this is a journey for the character that I would argue goes all the way up to when he dies in IVX. So 
what did you think of this big change? Uh, I really liked Scott in Astonishing, like a lot. Yeah. Um, I didn't appreciate his storyline so much in New X-Men. Going back and rereading it, I appreciate it a lot more just having been through things in life. Mm -hmm. uh, his evolution was very real for someone who has been through what he has been through. And he does have daddy issues. Oh, he does. You know, he does. And, and um, you know, they people make the joke that, like, girls marry their daddies. They, you know, they marry someone who kind of is very much like their parent. And then conversely, uh, mama's boys tend to marry women who are like their mothers. Uh, and tying into where reading Astonishing, you were questioning, could Emma be mind controlling him? Or is he being so agreeing because she's the professor x of the team now yeah you, you just said it they don't have professor x he's now the leader and he has imposter syndrome syndrome and he doesn't know if he's the leader that life told him to be he's the the dawson's creek varsity blues i don't want your life uh you know he doesn't know if he can do it uh so he he tethers himself to the professor x type character yeah. uh and she's so confident that surely she must be right. Um, so it is, you know, we see him as the strong leader, but it is a direct tie to that kind of emotionally struggling man that we see in, in Morrison's run. Um, yeah, it's probably my favorite iteration of Scott. Yeah, I agree. And and at the end, of course, we, we wouldn't know it at the time when this was published, but we do see him finally embrace that leadership role and again, not, I, I'm sorry, I don't want to spoil this to anyone who hasn't read the rest of Astonishing, but he does eventually confront why he can't use his powers. Mm -hmm. And there's a brief period where he can. And there's also another period where Emma, exactly what you just said, kind of is like, you know, you always wanted to be someone else, you know, like you always want. And in this case, it was Wolverine, right? She was here like the poster boy for mutant cool. And like, he looks down and she had like psychically like made him up to be Wolverine. And he's like, you sick bitch. Uh -huh. And I think, I think you're right. I think Cyclops at the beginning of astonishing why people probably think he was being mind controlled. And I never thought about it until you said it is because he was letting her take the reins because that is a Magneto. That is an Xavier. That is a storm. Whoever figure who is very confident, who knows how to lead a team, Emma, for whatever you want to say, can lead a team. She can get shit done. She does her own way, very different from other people, but she gets shit done and she has the courage of her convictions. Cyclops is leaning into that, especially coming out of Morrison's arc. So, yeah. thank you. That's what I do. <laughs> Oh, and speaking of what you do, Blaine, thank you for being with us tonight. Where thank can you. the folks at home engage with you? Uh, so I have Blainer Things on Instagram and Twitter and not really YouTube. I did a couple of cheap toy reviews. Um, and then I, I haven't have seen them. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to oh, YouTube stalk you now. Terrible. Um, but my Instagram is mainly... Uh, uh, you know, art imitating life. And I try to use my platform to show just what kind of nerd pop in general uh, really means and, and uncover some truth there. And then I developed uh, another Instagram page called colored in comics and comics is spelled Q O M I X. And that page is specifically dedicated to uh, not just toy photography uh, representing art or representing life, but, uh, showing off and showcasing uh, marginalized people, oppressed people, in, and diverse people in comic books, movies, books, action figures, uh, all nerd pop, and showing that, um, you know, the, the characters, there's always a deeper meaning to things, um, and, and there has been representation in all the things that people love and might not particularly think there's a there's representation um, it's more geared towards the people that like i said earlier you know will will make fun of groups of people but then 
promote characters that are part of those communities. So it's to kind of show them um, don't don't think that we're not here. We're here, and it's to show the rest of our community that um, there's more of us than you think. We're not as alone as you think. Thank there you, you go. go. Um, Blaine, thank you so much for being with us tonight. And folks, as always, I'm the Uncanny Day Spring signing off. <laughs>